I'm Dr. Leslie Williams, and in this lecture, we are going to introduce three groups of agents that are commonly found in microbiology. They are the eukaryotic cells and the pathogens that result from the eukaryotic cells, the prokaryotic cells, and then also the viruses. So we are going to start by looking at this picture here. Here you can see that we have a prokaryotic cell up in the corner and a eukaryotic cell that takes up most of the space. So the first thing that you'll notice from this image is the size difference. So you'll notice that the eukaryotic cell is gonna be really big and the prokaryotic cell is comparably much smaller. In fact, the volume of a prokaryotic cell can be one one thousandth the volume of a eukaryotic cell. I often make the analogy that if you envisioned the classroom as the volume of a eukaryotic cell, then a prokaryotic cell might be the volume of a, of a chair or maybe even a large eraser. So that really gives you an indication for the difference in size. Now, you may have also learned that eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells are built totally differently. So eukaryotic cells tend to be much more complex. I'm going to write some words in here for you. They tend to be very complex. And they tend to have um, many more ways to organize themselves inside the cell. These organized areas, these special partitions, are bound by membranes and are termed organelles. So lots of internal organelles. And of course, the definition of a eukaryotic cell is going to be one that takes its genetic material, its DNA, and encompasses it in its own partitioned area, its own membrane-bound organelle, and that is a nucleus. So a eukaryotic cell is actually defined by the presence of a nucleus. And a nucleus, as you can see here, is its own special housing for the DNA. Now, when you turn and take a look at a prokaryotic cell, a prokaryotic cell does not seem to be nearly as complicated inside the cell. So if we take a look at the area inside the cell, which I'm coloring here, you'll notice there's some mumbo jumbo, but otherwise there's not a whole lot of organization. Whereas a eukaryotic cell is very well organized, there's lots of different specialized areas termed organelles that do their own special thing. A prokaryotic cell um, is really just an open space where everything can interact with everything else. So the DNA, which of course a prokaryotic cell is going to have, is not kept in a separate area. Rather, it's more like somebody took a bunch of yarn and balled it up and threw it in a corner and then said that's the area that we're going to keep DNA in that corner of the room. And so we actually do have a name for that location, um, but it's not bounded by a membrane like a nucleus is. So the area where the DNA is kind of thrown into some sort of corner here is referred to as a nucleoid. And I remember this word because it looks like nucleus combined with void, as in void of a nucleus. Prokaryotic cells do have DNA that is basically thrown off to one side of the cell. And when we think about what else might be in that prokaryotic cell, um, we basically have ribosomes. So ribosomes are an organelle that are found in all cells regardless of what type. What else do prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells share? 
Well, one of the other things that they must share, in addition to just having DNA and ribosomes, is they must share a boundary to the cell. And the boundary to the cell is termed the plasma or cell membrane. So both the eukaryotic and the prokaryotic cells are going to have the cell membrane. I have a tendency to call it by its maybe more old name, which is the plasma membrane. They mean the same thing. And so when we look at the anatomy of the prokaryotic versus eukaryotic cell, they don't seem to be very similar. In fact, if you look at this image of the prokaryotic cell on the left, you'll notice that there's a lot of stuff going on around the outside here. So lots of stuff seems to be outside of the cell or plasma membrane, including a cell wall, which is noticeably absent in our picture of the eukaryotic cell. Now, if you've taken a general bio class, you may recall that there are, in fact, some eukaryotic cells that do have a cell wall, but animal cells are not one of them. So, with the exception of fungi, which do have a cell wall, most of the eukaryotic pathogens that we encounter do not have a cell wall. Rather, they, their outer layer is a plasma membrane. Prokaryotic cells almost always have a cell wall, so that's a difference. Okay, now that we've compared and contrasted prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, let's take a look at viruses. Now, viruses are going to be the smallest of these um, particular agents. They are non-living, and if we were to draw out the structure of a virus, we could really draw three different parts. So let's go ahead and draw up a schematic on the side here. So you're going to start with some sort of nucleic acid information. It could be DNA, but it could also be RNA. Now, this is unusual because all living uh, cells use DNA as their genetic material. In other words, that's the type of molecule that we encode our genetic material in. Viruses are non-living and don't seem to so tightly adhere to our rules that DNA must be the genetic material. So there are human viruses out there, those are viruses that infect humans, that do use DNA as their genetic material, but then there's a variety of ones that use RNA. COVID is one of them. So what we have here is some sort of nucleic acid. Either DNA or RNA, but not both. And then that nucleic acid is housed in some sort of protective shell, also known as a coat. So the coat is going to start with a set of proteins that surround it. And the proteins tend to be geometric, meaning that they're the same protein repeated over and over and over again into some sort of geometric pattern, like a sphere or a cylinder or something like that. And this image over here, you can see that it looks kind of sphere-like. So that protein shell has a name and it is called a capsid. Now the capsid might be the outer layer of the virus, but there might be an additional layer outside of the capsid. If there is an additional layer, it is actually a, basically a derivation of the plasma membrane from whatever the virus infected. And so we denote that outer layer as being a type of membrane and we call it the envelope. So what I'm going to do here is I'm really just going to draw the envelope on part of my viral structure. And again, the envelope is going to be a membrane. Now, if there is an envelope, you are required, for reasons that we'll get into later in this class, to have some sort of proteinaceous protrusion sticking out.
and those are called spikes. And they're aptly named. They stick out like spikes, stick out of this spherical envelope. Okay, so viruses come in one of these two configurations. Either their outer layer is a capsid, or they have a capsid, but the outer layer is actually an envelope. And we actually have names to describe these two different structures. If they only have a capsid, then we call them naked. Fun name, got your attention, didn't it? I wish I could tell you that the other strategy is to be clothed, but it's not. If you have an outer layer as an envelope, then you are called an enveloped virus. Okay, so that's basically gonna be where we stop for viruses. We are going to spend most of the last part of the class looking at the viral structure, including the difference between naked and enveloped and how that impacts the virus's ability to cause disease, as well as doing a tour of viral diseases. So we'll revisit this in the last part of the class. So what we're going to do now is we are going to fill in a table that compares and contrasts some of the features of eukaryotic cells with prokaryotic cells. So some of the information that I wrote previously is going to be charted down here. So eukaryotic cells are going to be living, obviously. Prokaryotic cells are also living. And viruses are considered to be non-living. Biologists have agreed upon a set of, you know, five or six criteria that are required to be considered alive, and viruses do not satisfy all of them. For instance, they are unable to perform their own chemical reactions independently, metabolism. They are unable to sense and respond to the environment like a living cell is. Okay, so what else do we have? Well, let's take a look at the genetic material. All living things use DNA as their genetic code. Viruses can use either DNA or RNA, but not both. So viruses are actually defined by what type of genetic material they use. For instance, um, uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus, SARS, Two, and SARS-1 actually as well, uses RNA, whereas herpes viruses use DNA. So there's a, an example of a difference. Okay, when we take a look at the size, we know that eukaryotic cells are going to be the largest. Now remember, these are all going to be microscopic, but eukaryotic cells will be the largest. You know what, I'll go ahead and put largest cells. Prokaryotic cells are much, much smaller. In lab, you'll get a real good look at just how small they are. And viruses are even smaller, so small that we are not able to see them with a light microscope. Eukaryotic cells are separated from prokaryotic cells in a definition perspective by the presence or absence of a nucleus. So if a cell has a true nucleus, the definition of a true nucleus is one where the DNA is housed in its own membranous organelle, then you are called a eukaryotic cell. The prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus, but rather house their DNA in just a generic area, like throwing it into the corner of a room, and we call that area the nucleoid. Okay, as stated earlier, eukaryotic cells tend to be rather complex internally.
whereas prokaryotic cells are much more simple. There's no internal separation that happens where you take areas and you partition them off like you do with eukaryotic cells. So prokaryotic cells lack what are called membrane-bound organelles. Remember that prokaryotic cells do have ribosomes, but as you will recall once you read chapter 8 of the workbook, ribosomes are not don't, are not part of a membrane. They don't have a membrane in their structure. They can be attached to membranes, which is when you get rough endoplasmic reticulum, but they themselves are not membranous. Okay, and the last thing I want to look at is, you know, if you are a living creature, when you take one cell, is that the whole organism or is that just part of an organism? So humans are, of course, built of eukaryotic cells. But if you isolate one human cell, like from your cheek, that's not an organism. So we call ourselves multicellular. Meaning that the entire individual is built up of more than one cell. In humans' cases, millions and millions of them. So eukaryotic cells tend to be multicellular, although unicellular, meaning one cell, organisms do exist. We see this most often with the protists and occasionally yeast. In contrast, prokaryotic cells are always unicellular, meaning one cell equals one individual. They are not constructed in a way that allows them to specialize into distinct cells and make up complicated individuals that are built of multiple cells. Okay. One other thing I want to point out is that both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells, or any cell, should be able to reproduce independently. So I'm going to put that up here, actually. And by independently, what I mean is they should be able to reproduce on their own if given the appropriate nutrients, water, conditions, stimulation, etc. Viruses are incapable of reproducing on their own. Viruses require a human cell in order to reproduce. So viruses must hijack your cells in order to successfully reproduce. They cannot reproduce without cells. So I put the word host in there. A host cell simply just means that that cell has become a host unwillingly, mind you, but a host to the virus. So we'll often talk about people as being hosts to a particular infectious disease. It means they're housing that particular pathogen somewhere in their body. All right, that concludes our introduction to the three major groups of microbes that we are going to encounter in this class.